Thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. This is the debut episode of Just the Worst Podcast. I'm your host, Bully Donnelly. Uh, you can find me at thisisinfamous.com as well as joeblow.com. And um, been a while since I've hopped behind the mic, hit the record button, and started podcasting. Uh, been too long, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, but as we've been going along, in the since I, I've taken... Sort of a hiatus of sorts, I guess. Um, people keep asking me all the time, Billy, when are you going to do podcasting again? When are you going to bring the podcasting back? Uh, when are you going to... When, when? When? And I never had an answer for them. And and it was sad because I really enjoyed doing podcasts all this time. Uh, I always liked doing podcasts. Um, radio was something I was always interested in doing. And unfortunately, uh, terrestrial radio just never really panned out for me. So podcasting was a was an alternative means of, of getting my opinion, my voice, my, my thoughts, my expressions out there. Um, with the idea that somebody was out there listening as well. And so... Podcasting was always something that I enjoyed doing, and uh, in, in taking time off, um, I, I realized I missed it. I, I really enjoyed doing podcasts on a regular basis, and uh, that was kind of the formulation of, of this idea here to uh, to launch Just the Worst podcast, um, which will not just be one podcast. Uh, we got some ideas uh, we're putting it together right now. Everything's still in the baby stages. This is the very first episode. Um, not really winging it. Uh, once again, uh, lo- lots of things are in the works. They're they're in the very toddler stages, I guess, um, so to speak. Um, so as a result, with this podcast right here, this very first one uh, coming right out of the gate, uh, will not be. Uh, as glamorous uh, or accessible as we hope to have everything else coming around uh, very soon. So, um, you know, subscribing to iTunes, um, you're going to have to wait a little bit for that. Same thing with, with Stitcher. Um, even a web page, um, you know, a, a site is, is in the process of coming along. So, um, you know, we're, we're getting there. Uh, we're, we're, we'll get there very, very quickly. Um, you're just going to have to be a little bit patient. Uh, as right now, we just we just kind of do it very raw, very bare bones, very basic uh, to start. Just to kind of get the ball rolling, see how things are going, uh, and then we can build from there. So if you enjoy uh, what you like here, uh, you, you like listening to this, you like the format of the show, uh, you like me kind of just flying solo here and, and, uh, and shooting the shit with you, then, then by all means, tell your friends, spread the word, and, uh, and let's pick up some steam here so we can do some more of the bigger things uh, that we have some ideas for. Because like I said, this is not, this is not just going to be a, a, a once a week podcast. Um, I mean, this, this particular show will be a once a week podcast. This will be a weekly podcast. But the idea is to have multiple shows throughout the week, all of different format, all of different style, all of different substance, um, and have them go forth as weekly podcasts. So basically you would have several weekly podcasts that just happen to come through on a daily basis. So several daily weekly podcasts. Um, and that would make up the schedule. So that's that's kind of the, the goal here. And, and, you know, once again, uh, having always loved podcasts and wanting to do a little bit more with it, and especially seeing how everything is moving uh, much more digitally uh, and, and how we consume our media, how we bring in our content. Um, podcasts just seem to be a natural fit and, and a natural progression to try in and, and continue to evolve um as 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 a way of getting my my thoughts out there in the world to uh to whoever is out there listening so um so that's the goal there uh just just kind of as a basic so i want to thank you at least for coming along for the first ride these first impressions to kind of see where things go and uh and see how they work out and um 
you know, and, and just just see how it starts to come together. Because, uh, you know, once again, this is, uh, this is my first time back in the saddle uh, for, for a couple of months. Um, you know, previously... I uh, had done a show called Screenshots uh, over at This Is Infamous with my good friend Brian McKevitt. Um, and we, we did them uh, on a weekly basis, uh, mostly weekly. There were a couple times we had to take weeks off uh, for circumstances, one reason or another. Um, and, and, you know, I always enjoy doing my podcast with, with Brian. Uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, we work well together. Uh, we bullshit well together. Uh, and, and as a result, I, I thought we always had some, some really good shows, uh, both informative and entertaining, which is kind of the point of doing this show here too. And, um, you know, one thing led to another real life circumstances came in and, uh, he wasn't able to devote as much time commitment to doing the podcast regularly, uh, in order to make it work. And as a result, uh, we, we had to put it on the shelf. And then we never got to take it off. So uh, that show has has been collecting dust. It's going to continue to collect dust, and it's a it's just the way of moving on to the next step, doing something uh, fresh, and um, and putting an entirely different spin on it. Um, doing what I think I'm good at, uh, what I think you'll enjoy, uh, what I think will entertain you, uh, what I think will will provoke thought inside of your head you know that that's also a good part of it bringing things up uh through my eyes the way i see them um and maybe provoking a little thought in your head maybe getting you to think about things a little bit differently maybe getting you thing to to consider things um a little bit differently than you had maybe getting you to broaden your horizons a little bit so if i can do that uh i will consider this a success um on a number of levels and uh, and hopefully, uh, we we grow to love one another uh, in in future weeks, future episodes, and just uh, just as we progress forward with just the worst podcast. So um, the idea here with this particular show, uh, which is which is just going to kind of be the the crowning jewel, I guess, uh, of of just the worst podcast. Um, you know, uh, movies is my background, movies is my love, movies is my passion. So the idea here is to kind of just go through uh, some of the bigger developments that we've gone, that we've seen happen uh, over the course of the, the past week. Kind of a week in review uh, of, of, of everything that's, that's, come, that's come down the pipeline. Kind of sort through it. Put it into some context, figure out what it means, whether or not it's important, uh, and, and what makes it interesting to talk about. So uh, so it's going to be a lot of just me expressing uh, what I know, uh, what I think, what I believe about a lot of this, and, uh, and toss it to you in that context uh, for you to consider and, and form your own ideas, form your own opinions, whether they are uh, agreeable to mine or disagreeable. And you know what? Look, uh, I, I'm not looking for to preach to the choir either. I'm not looking to to develop a, a, a cult like following of any of any sort who just thinks, "Hey, Billy, you're the greatest. Everything you say is right, 100 percent. I couldn't agree more." Uh, it's as if our minds are, are, are melded as one. Uh, I, I don't really want that, <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest with you. In fact, uh, it kind of would freak me out a little bit uh, if, if that's where we were at. So, um, you know, once again, this is more for to, to help you uh, form your own opinions. Uh, not, not help you. Look, you, you don't need help. You form your own opinions about whatever it is that you want. And you're going to think whatever it is that you want. You're going to believe whatever it is that you want. And you're going to come to your own conclusions. Uh, And, you know, there may be times where I say something and you're just yelling at this podcast. Like, I can't believe he said that. He doesn't know what he's talking about. That's that's fine. I welcome that kind of uh, conversation. There are going to be other times where you're like, right on the money. But uh, just know that these, everything that gets put out here uh, is authentic. It's uh, it's personal to me. 
And uh, you know, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of anyone uh, in any way, shape, or form. It's just this is me. You know, this is what I think, and uh, and that's it. So so don't don't take anything I say personally. Don't take it as any type of slight or invalidation uh, of your opinions. Uh, there, there's just there's too much of that uh, going around uh, within it. all kinds of fandoms. You know, people people f- f- take some type of criticism. Or, or difference in opinion as some kind of slight against them. And uh, that, that's not what I'm doing at all. Uh, this, this, is, this is all me, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. And um, uh, that, that, that's that. So, uh, so with that said, um, we're going to jump right into a bunch of stuff. And uh, we'll see where things take us as we kind of navigate what's been going on uh, in the movie industry, uh, movie business, uh, movie fandoms. Uh, over the past week or, or so. So I guess the obvious place to kind of kick things off uh, would be within the Star Wars universe or the Star Wars galaxy, per se, uh, where every day it seems like somebody wants to talk about something uh, Star Wars almost as much as Marvel. Marvel is, is, is typically the, the, the conversation hog uh, where we're just... Anything that anybody says that is even somewhat related to the Marvel Cinematic Universe becomes just this huge deal for one reason or another. Uh, even when they're not saying anything. You know, I, I believe uh, Sebastian Stan was was interviewed up at Toronto International Film Festival uh, asked about uh, whether or not uh, Bucky Barnes and the Winter Soldier would, would take on the mantle of Captain America at some point uh, in the MCU. And Sebastian Stan gave this very kind of sarcastic, oh, I think about it every day, you know, kind of response. Uh, and, you know, and then uh, kind of send what all he can say, which is like, you know, uh, I'll do whatever they want me to do. If they want me to be Captain America, I'll be Captain America. If they want me to stay the Winter Soldier, I'll be the Winter Soldier. If they want Bucky Barnes to... to you know, uh, come back and, and be resurrected in, in, in some way, uh, I'll do that. Uh, you know, and then goes on to talk about Captain America's Civil War and how it's going to have incredible fighting and be action-packed and, and whatever. And, you know, and we've heard we've heard the, the, the Captain America Civil War is going to be amazing uh, spiel, uh, what I feel like a million times over to the point that when next May comes around, if this is not like the most amazing superhero movie, uh, ever made, I'm going to be somewhat disappointed because of all the hype that's gone into telling me how amazing it's going to be uh, months and months and months and months and months in advance. But once again, it, it just feeds into the this idea that everything somebody says that now deals with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we're so consumed by the the largeness, the massive scope and scale uh, of the MCU that even when people say something uh, completely worthless. Uh, it somehow has value. So you know, and, and that that's just where the Marvel thing is, and and, and Star Wars is, is the same way, but not not the same way. Look, Mar- Marvel's an, another machine, but Star Wars is just something that you know we've we've grown up with for a long, long time, uh, from one generation to another. Whether you grew up with the original trilogy or you grew up with the prequels, Star Wars is something that has consumed a number of generations. Uh, over many, many years. And the fact that Star Wars is now coming back just feeds the frenzy and the enthusiasm even more. You know, Far- Force Friday uh, just happened a couple weeks back. And look, I, I went out there. I was out at midnight. Not, not to go out and buy uh, anything uh, crazy. Uh, I went out at 6 o'clock in the morning to the Disney store to do that and buy my Star Wars Elite Series figures uh, exclusive to the Disney store. Uh, I got my BB-8. I uh, picked that up uh, later in the day. But look, I, I understand the fandom and how it runs wild. Uh, and as a result, when something Star Wars comes up, that that's what everybody wants to talk about at this point. Because as much as people got burnt by the prequels, as much of the, the mystery that now goes into The Force Awakens, um, people tend to have a really good experience with Star Wars overall. Um, you know, there's 
let, let's face it. We, we've had some detours. Uh, we've had some bumps in the road. Um, but by and large, when Star Wars is good, it's really good. Uh, and that trumps any of the mistakes that may have been wa- made along the way. Like, none of this uh, George Lucas, you know, rape my childhood uh, bullshit that gets circulated every once in a while um, by people who who just haven't grown to put things in perspective. But uh, but just more, you know, th- there, there are bad things that have happened, but the good Trump, like, for every Phantom Menace disappointment... You know, we have Star Wars, A New Hope. We have The Empire Strikes Back. And we have the the really good stuff in Return of the Jedi. You know, and, and that helps us overlook the bad. You know, Star Wars isn't tainted uh, because we had some bad things. It, it just, we just view it a little bit differently. So, you know, the even though people have been burnt before going into the force awakens, there's an enthusiasm. There's an excitement once again, uh, that as we've get, gotten closer, uh, people want to feast on all the little nuggets about what could this mean? What could this be? What's coming up next? Um, and this week we got one that people had started to jump all over, uh, and speculate. And this was a rumor. This one came out of Schmo's no, uh, which is another movie podcast out there, and like, I'm not I'm not trying to start any kind of beef uh, with the Schmoes No Crew. Um, I just I just tend to believe uh, that this idea, this uh, this sourced rumor uh, that, that that they started circulating uh, is is kind of bullshit. But um, let me explain to you what it is, and you can you can kind of uh, determine for yourself where you think that this this one starts. And this one has to do with uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens, which will be arriving uh, December 18th, uh, later this year, finally. Um, had we had things gone to plan, we would have already been talking about this movie. It would have come in, in May. Uh, but it wasn't ready. There were some delays. Got pushed back to December, and you know anything uh, anything good is worth waiting for. So, uh, so Star Wars: The Force Awakens will be arriving in December, and this rumor uh, posits that there will be a post credits stinger or a teaser of some sort that would build excitement and uh, and kind of. Once again, going back to the idea of teasing, would tease uh, what's to come for Rogue One, a Star Wars story, which is the first of the Star Wars standalones um, directed by uh, Gareth Edwards, who who did uh, Godzilla. Um, And the plot behind this film is that it takes place between, it takes place before Star Wars A New Hope with a a group of rebels going out and stealing or attempting to steal the plans for the Death Star. That that's that's the idea. Now, where I'm gonna call bullshit uh, on on this on this 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 post credit starting is that there doesn't need to be a a stinger or teaser of any sort during Star Wars The Force Awakens, which is effectively Episode 7, for a movie that essentially is going back in time and is giving us another prequel-type route into Star Wars A New Hope. We know about the Death Star, we know about Darth Vader, we know about the Rebels wanting the plans, we know about all of these things. There is absolutely no sensical reason why there would be a post credit stinger at the end of a core saga film that would then lead us into a standalone prequel that leads into the original trilogy. It just it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Zero. None. Nothing at all. And look, I, I get it. I, I get where the idea comes from. 
Uh, which is once again, like why I call bullshit on this, you know, uh, Marvel popularized the, the post credit stinger as, as a lead in to future films. You know, Nick Fury shows up at the end of the Avengers, not at, at the end of Iron Man, um, talking about the, uh, the Avengers initiative and fans go crazy because they know now that this, this universe is expanding. There's something else out there beyond Iron Man. And that was Marvel. You know, previously, post credit singers were just kind of like a nice little nod to the audience. Maybe something, maybe a thread that wasn't closed up during the, the running time of the feature. So they stick something at the end for anybody, for, for diehards to, to kind of pick up later. You know, anybody who might have stuck around past the credits or anybody who later on you know, heard about it and they, they just, they wanted the complete experience. They wanted that in, they wanted to be on the inside of that joke. They wanted that extra little, they wanted the, the fries at the bottom of the bag. You know, they, they wanted that little extra nod that says, Hey, this is pretty cool. Isn't it? You're in on this with us. They wanted that. Marvel took it to a whole nother level and used that to, help build their crossovers into other films, which help build their shared universe, which help build the MCU as we know it, and and so on and so forth. Um, and look, just because Marvel is owned by Disney, and now Lucasfilm and Star Wars are owned by Disney, does not mean that they're all going to do the same thing or read from the same playbook. Star Wars, look, they paid a lot of money for this thing. When George Lucas decided, I, I had enough, I'm going to go off and make my experimental films, like he's been saying for the last 45 years, and decided to sell, you know, Star Wars became a viable property for, for Disney at that point. It, was, it wasn't something they were just going to take and sit on. They were going to take and use it. And now we're going to have Star Wars all the time. We're going to have episode 7, then a standalone. Then episode 8, then a standalone. Then episode 9, then a standalone. And then they're going to continue to branch out. You know, there could be episodes 10, 11, and 12, depending on what they do with these new characters of the core saga. And then they're just going to start to explore other areas of the galaxy and, and start to give us more of these prequel and origin type stories uh, that... You know, I'm, I'm still on the fence on because everybody wanted to know about the Clone Wars when it came to the prequels, and, and we didn't really get Clone Wars until they decided to to go animated series. And even then, that took a while to kind of ratchet up before we, we got some cool stories out of that. Here, we're looking at, you know, Rogue One dealing with, with Rebels trying to steal um, plans for the Death Star. We're talking about... Uh, a young Han Solo movie, possibly a Boba Fett film. You know, all of these type of explanations on where these characters came from uh, in order to become the, the characters that we loved, in addition to exploring newer characters that we don't know anything about, newer corners of the galaxy that we don't know anything about, which is kind of the basis, I think, for the, the TV show uh, that we never got into, was to kind of go into go away from the Skywalkers, go away from the Empire, go away from the Rebels, per se, uh, and, and, and the, the well-known characters within those confines, and go into other areas uh, that we didn't know anything about. You know, maybe get into the huts for a little bit. Maybe learn about some Jawas or some sand people. Learn about the, the Mos Eisley's cantina and how it was somebody's dream to open up that shitty bar. <laughs> you know, look, get into some of those things um, and, and, and see how that works. And just because they're going to expand the Star Wars universe in some way, does not mean they're going to do exactly what was done within Marvel Studios in expanding that universe. So I think the the idea to, to just take the Star Wars galaxy and, and, and layer it 
on top of the Marvel blueprint and try to do the exact same thing. I think it's apples and oranges. I don't think they're the exact same thing. I think Star Wars is, is, is a juggernaut that's going to be perfectly fine uh, getting off on its own. And just the fact that they have a Star Wars story on these standalones, I think, is a huge help. And I don't think they need to necessarily tie it into everything else the way Marvel did. Uh, because they were still building a brand. Star Wars is, is a pretty pretty well-known, pretty cemented brand uh, that I don't think they need to rely on those kind of tricks uh, to, to lure fans in. I think I think The Force Awakens is going to do enough, and then anything else after that that has Star Wars name on it, uh, it'll be gravy. So, um, But look, this, this kind of just goes into, um, you know, the rumor mill that... that keeps on churning all the time you know and and where where some of these stories come from the star wars one i think just comes from the fact that like oh disney's owned by star wars owned by disney marvel's owned by disney they're probably going to do the same thing up oh, post credit stinger look it's a rumor it's uh, it's not really a rumor it's it's, it's a rumor because you it's not true and you made it up but it's not it's not it's no real meat to to that being a legitimate thing uh, and I would be incredibly surprised if at December you, we got uh, a film that had something post-credits that, to, to try and tease Rogue One. I'd be surprised if there was something post-credits to tease uh, Episode Eight. Because I just don't see it. it, and it doesn't fit within the structure of a Star Wars film. Star Wars films, typically, the lore is uh, of the next film is just contained within the film you're watching, you know, that film is good, therefore, I want to see the next one. Even the prequels, you know, we can't, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're good, but there's enough stuff going on there that even if you didn't like it, you still wanted to see where it continued next. I don't like the Phantom Menace, but this Darth Maul guy is dead. And what's going on with... How, how is Darth Vader going to eventually come to be? What's going on with his baby Anakin Skywalker? Ah, I'll go see Attack of the Clones. That's how the original trilogy worked. Star Wars was just a thing. You know, George Lucas had these ideas, but Star Wars was just Star Wars. Before it was a new hope, it was just Star Wars. And when that made it, The Empire Strikes Back was able to come from that. And from The Empire Strikes Back, The Empire Strikes Back ends on a cliffhanger. Which makes you want to come back to Return of the Jedi. But it is still its own film. It doesn't need to use that extra dangling carrot to get you to come back. The story structure alone is enough to get you to come back. Everything that you need to, to, to see and know is contained within the film. And in, within that film, you want to know what happens next. Like any good movie would. Like any good story would be. You see what it is and then you want to see what happens next. Especially in a continuing series. So I, I, think, I think just the... Um, just the idea of a post credit stinger on a Star Wars film kind of just feels dirty to me. Um, it, it makes me kind of cringe uh, because I don't want to see it. You know, you you look at any of the original trilogy films, how Star Wars ends. You know, with the scene at the metal, how a uh, Empire Strikes uh, Empire Strikes Back ends with Lando and Chewbacca taking the the Millennium Falcon out and just having uh, Luke and Leia with the droids watching out. Uh, into the spacecape and, and ending on that note, um, you know, Return of the Jedi ends with the celebration at, Ewo at Ewok Village. Uh, I don't care what any special edition says, that's how it ends <laughs> with a party at the Ewok Village and a nub nub song, not not some intergalactic celebration. Um, so you know, I, so I think I think they all they all close on on. They all have their moments of finality, and they all close on those moments. And I think to to add something after that would kind of cheapen it uh, a little bit. Just kind of just kind of add too much salt to the pot, and 
not a fan. So I'm, I, I, I'm calling BS. My BS alarm is just going off on this. So so don't feed too much into that. But but look, the, the, once again, this, these are how the rumors uh, get get churned along. You know, pe- people see these things and you know, they try to draw their own parallels. They try to say, oh, well, this is how things are uh, in, in one, one way. So this is how they should be all the time, which kind of feeds me, you know, now circling back into the Marvel Cinematic Universe where... Once again, there's more rumors uh, surrounding Captain Marvel, which is a you know a big deal in Marvel because this is going to be the first female-led superhero movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We have Black Widow, you know, Wasp is on the way at some point in time, but this is the first one that's going to have a female superhero's name bang right on the marquee. You know, DC is going to have their Wonder Woman. But for what Marvel's been building, this is the first time that Marvel is, is finally giving uh, a superheroine the ball to run with. So Captain Marvel is a big deal. Uh, and as we've, we've heard over months and months and months uh, with, Mar- with Marvel Studios finally making Captain Marvel official, is all of these names as to who could possibly be Captain Marvel. And that's, uh, there's all kinds of rumors. It started with Emily Blunt. Uh, I've also heard uh, Alice Eve's name come up. Uh, Katie Sackhoff's name come up for obvious reasons. Uh, Ronda Rousey's name has come up. Gina Carano's name has come up. The latest rumor coming up now, Rebecca Ferguson, who's reported to be the, the top choice on Marvel's prospect list for Captain Marvel. So there's a lot of names that are getting thrown up there for who could possibly fill in the role of Carol Danvers, who for a while was possibly going to appear at the end of Avengers Age of Ultron in a cameo. Josh Whedon kind of wanted that, but they decided not to just kind of throw the character into this very small cameo. And plus they didn't have the casting right just yet. So it's not like they're not looking for an actress to be Captain Marvel. They just don't know who it's going to be yet. And I think a lot of the the rumors that continue to churn about are essentially fan-created. It's fantasy casting for who they think Captain Marvel will be. Another name, Charlize Theron, is another name that keeps getting thrown out there. Uh, so Emily Blunt's up in Toronto at Toronto International Film Festival to promote Sicario. And uh, in the way that, that these interviews typically go now, everybody wants to, to try and hunt for the scoop. So she's asked about Captain Marvel and, and you know, whether or not she's going to be playing Captain Marvel and, and whatnot. I has this interview with IndieWire <clears throat> where she basically says, I, don't, I, I haven't heard anything. I don't know anything. And, you know, at one point she she had conversations with Marvel about possibly taking on uh, Black Widow before Scarlett Johansson took it. And the scheduling didn't work out. They couldn't make it work. And as a result, they kind of, you know, th- there was an interest on, on both sides, but it, it just didn't come together. So now as a result, because Emily Blunt had a discussion a while back, her name keeps getting thrown back up for anything that, uh, that Marvel wants to do that, that's female driven. So... In addition to to saying that um, she doesn't know anything, and she's not having talks with Marvel about being Captain Marvel, um, she also added an interesting quote, which I'm going to read word for word, to to because I think it's important. I think it says a lot about kind of where these rumors come from and and how we how we contribute to them uh, with our own closed mindedness. So here's what Blunt has to say to IndieWire. She says, uh, "I think it's because the list is very short." Speaking of uh, her name constantly being rumored for Captain Marvel as well as with others. uh, Because we don't see women in these kind of roles. So I think as soon as you do a role like that, like Charlize did or I did or Rebecca's done, there's like four of us or something and Jen Lawrence. So I feel like us four, we get talked about and Angie, Angelina. So it's a list of like four women who are going to be considered for those kind of roles. So I think that's why the rumors happen because they're like, who else? 
Surely not another girl can wield a gun, you know what I mean? A woman doing push-ups? There's only one who can do that. So you're taking a very select crop of, of actresses, and because they've done action-driven films in the past, we look at them as being the only people that could possibly do another role that has similar skill set. So Captain Marvel, action-based superhero, lots of CGI, big blockbuster. Who could possibly do it? Well, Rebecca Ferguson was in Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, did a fine job in there. Lots of action, throw her on the list. Emily Blunt, Sicario, lots of action. Edge of Tomorrow, lots of action. Put her on the list. Angelina Jolie did Wanted, did the Tomb Raider movies. She's Laura Croft, for Christ's sakes. Gotta be on the list. Jennifer Lawrence. Hunger Games. Put her on the list. Charlize Theron. Mad Max Fury Road kicked ass as Furiosa. Stick her on the list. And as a result... Hollywood now has this closed-mindedness as, well, these people have done it before, so they must be able to do it again, and there can't be possibly anybody else who could handle these roles. Because, once again, we can only cast people to do the same thing all the time. Which is how, you know, Adam Sandler movies were were made. <laughs> and And Melissa McCarthy movies were made over the past few years before she started to to branch out a little bit more. They were all based off of her character in Bridesmaid. And, and, and as fans, as movie lovers, quote unquote, we start to see the same thing. We start to see these, um, we start to typecast on our own. Now look, don't get me wrong. Many of the names that are mentioned for Captain Marvel would probably be very good fits. But they can't also be the only names in consideration. That's like if when Marvel goes to reboot Spider-Man, saying that the only two people who it could possibly be are either Andrew Garfield again or Tobey Maguire because they've already been Spider-Man. We're always afraid to move outside of the comfort level. Move away from what we know. Because what we know makes us feel safe. Oh, but I've already seen Emily Blunt in an action role. And she's really good at it. So if she got another one, that would hopefully mean that Captain Marvel is good. Because she was good in Edge of Tomorrow in an action role. So she's got to be good in Captain Marvel in an action role. Same thing with Charlize Theron. Badass in Mad Max Free Road. So if she were to be Captain Marvel, got to be badass again. Even though there are probably a number of actresses who, if they had the chance to play Carol Danvers uh, in Captain Marvel, would absolutely knock it out of the park. Absolutely. And that's why when I think Marvel gets down to filling this role... It's not going to be one of the names that are, that are being tossed about here. Because it's never how they cast these, these films... You go back and you look at everyone who's been cast in these superhero roles for them, and it's never, never the people that you would expect. Never. I mean, you just look at it. Robert Downey Jr. Had not, hadn't done anything that, that would lead you to believe he was going to be Iron Man. Even now, moving, now moving forward... Every role he does seems to have Tony Stark in it. But prior to that, he was never really like that. Robbie Downey Jr. did all kinds of things. But if you were to look at, you know, something like Chaplin, you would never say, oh, that guy's clearly set up to be Iron Man. Crims Hemsworth had done nothing before becoming Thor. 
Chris Evans had done a bunch of stuff, but never anything that would say that guy's Captain America. Mark Ruffalo is the Hulk? Even as Bruce Banner. You would have never really said, yeah. Seems about right. So, and that's the way that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been built. Look at, even now, moving forward, you know, Paul Rudd was never somebody who you'd look at and say, that's a superhero. But in being Scott Lang for Ant-Man, worked. You look at Doctor Strange. Joaquin Phoenix was choice number one. There's nothing about Joaquin Phoenix that you say, yep, superhero. Marvel tends to go outside the box. They think outside the box. That's, that's some of the brilliant casting that gets done is when people think outside the box. So I, I don't think you're going to see an Emily Blunt here or Rebecca Ferguson. No, it doesn't matter what the, the rumored lists are. You know, those are the pipe dreams. It's like, it's like wanting George Clooney for every movie. Of course you do. Doesn't mean you're going to get them. Sometimes you got to say, uh, let's, let's look for a better fit. And uh, I, I don't know that any of these Captain Marvel rumors are going to kind of shake out. I, I really think it's going to be somebody off this beaten path. And uh, when that happens, uh, I will not be surprised. Because that, that tends to be Marvel's track record. Uh, one of the other things that, that's coming up in, in kind of the... The rumor mill, and, and once again, this this goes to show how we draw certain parallels, and, and uh, there goes a rumor. This one just started circulating a little while before I started recording this podcast, which is this idea uh, that over at Warner Brothers, um, Christopher Nolan is going to go make an Akira movie. Now, Christopher Nolan has an untitled project that has now been dated. That we do know. July 21st, 2017, Christopher Nolan will have a new movie in theaters. That's when the next one's coming. Which means he's going to shoot it sometime next year. Sometime in 2016, Christopher Nolan will get behind the camera and shoot something that is secretive as all hell. Incredibly closely guarded and mysterious that we will know very little about. And now there's these rumors that it going to be the first leg of an Akira trilogy that he's going to be somehow involved in. Because I think at some point he may have had a conversation with somebody who used to be involved in Akira and isn't anymore. And this is how all Christopher Nolan rumors start. Akira is is set up at Warner Brothers. And Christopher Nolan does his films for Warner Brothers. The, The Dark Knight trilogy for Warner Brothers. Interstellar for Warner Brothers. Prestige for Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers. That's where Christopher Nolan is set up. So when there's a high profile, big picture that that seems to need a, a little extra push, it automatically goes to, well, maybe Christopher Nolan is involved. Look, Christopher Nolan can't be involved in everything. Christopher Nolan is actually very picky about what he gets involved in. And I I find it really hard to believe that Christopher Nolan would say, Akira, that's that's the one I want to do. I'm just I'm just not seeing it. I'm just not buying it. So so once again, like this is this is how the rumors get started is that people draw these parallels based off of things that have happened in the past, and that's how some of these rumors look. Uh, don't don't get me wrong. There are rumors that become factual. There are plenty of rumors that become factual. There are plenty of rumors that are smoke to some type of burning fire. It may just be it may just be sparking, but it's it's gonna start raging sooner rather than later. And then there are other rumors that are just total bullshit. Christopher Nolan doing Akira. I'm going to put that one right up there towards towards the bullshit. So, um, once again, these are how things operate. So, uh, so, so keep that in mind. 
when you hear some of these things, keep that perspective going around. Keep that context. I think it's incredibly important uh, as, as you try to navigate the world of of uh, of internet bullshit uh, and, and how people want to try and lure you in for clicks with these ideas that are so far-fetched and outrageous. But you can't help but read them just in case they might be true. What if? Just what if? What if? I don't know. Could be. Could be. Could be. So you stay with it. Um, let's shift gears over to uh, to the DC Cinematic Universe, though, because Zack Snyder had a bunch of things to say uh, in recent days about uh, Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. Uh, and I want to get into a couple of them because I think they're 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 pretty big. Uh, in terms of his understanding of the characters that he has uh, and his understanding of the character's place in the world. So, um, one, there's been this talk of uh, Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice being more of a Batman movie than a Superman movie. Uh, For some reason, after Man of Steel became so divisive, those over at Warner Brothers seem to be incredibly gun shy about engaging in anything to Superman. Like did it, anything that's too much Superman, they're kind of nervous about. And as a result, they just because of the success of Nolan's Bat trilogy, they just want to throw Batman on everything. He's like bacon right now. Like they just they just want to wrap. Batman on everything. What do we got? Just wrap it in Batman. And Bacon. But mostly Batman. Because they just think, hey, you know, Batman's a huge deal. And it is a huge deal. Except Batman is also special. Like, you can't just try Batman out all the time because, like, you, got, you, don't, you don't know what else to do. Because in the long run, what it does is just people get tired of Batman because they just... They, they have no time to miss him. They just see him all the time. So, like, the specialness of Batman is now gone. And, and you know, that was part of uh, the decision to make Man of Steel 2 into Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice, build towards the Justice League, and expand, is that there was no confidence in a Man of Steel 2 going forward. So they figured we'll get Batman in there. So there's this, been this a lot of talk about there being a lot of Batman trying to add more Batman. Warner Brothers wants more Batman, more Batman, more Batman. We need more Bat. Get more of the Bat. Get get Affleck in here. More Batman. Batman, Batman, Batman. Just all Batman. Just just like it's like taking like just gravy, just drenching, just drenching your movie and just bat gravy, just bat, bat gravy. I love it. Just drench it. It's like having like very little ice cream, but like uh, just a, a pool of chocolate syrup on your Sunday. Just uh, I don't need a, who who needs ice cream? I got all this chocolate syrup. And that's what the, and that's what Batman is right now. So uh, so Jack Snyder gets asked about it, and he confirms it uh, in 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 so many words. And here's his quote: He says, "Only in that because it's a different Batman than the Batman that was in the Chris Nolan movies, so we have a little bit more explaining to do. And you just had a whole Superman movie, but I think only in that way because you need to understand where Batman is with everything, and that's more toward the beginning, but it evens back out as it goes on." So what it essentially says is going into Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, uh, especially where things kick off, we're going to get a lot of Batman. It's going to be primarily front-loaded with Batman. And uh, I don't understand why that has to be, because we're not stupid. No one who's going to see Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice, is confused in any way, shape, or form about Batman who Batman is, or what Batman's motivations might be. You can just look at the trailer, like the extended trailer they released, and you can get a pretty idea, pretty good idea of who Batman is in this world and why Bruce Wayne might be pissed off. I mean, there's all types of like 9-11 imagery dealing with like the Battle of Metropolis and whatnot, 
and Bruce Wayne witnessing it and, you know, his building coming down. Probably probably lots of his friends and colleagues and whatnot, uh, employees just dying. And as a result, you could probably see him being like, I hate Superman. That doesn't mean we need, like, 45 minutes of exposition on, on, on Bruce Wayne and Batman. That just seems ridiculous. We all know it. We don't... Listen, we don't need origin stories for some of these superheroes. I get that we had a whole one with Man of Steel. We didn't even need much of that. It's because even though you're changing some of it, the core of it is still very much the same. Batman, Superman, Spider-Man never need to hear their origin stories again. Never. Even if you tweak them a little bit, even if you're like, oh, well, what if we, what if our universe is slightly different? I don't care. Because at the very heart of who they are, their origin story will remain the same. So just hit the ground running with them. Rather than say, like, well, we're going to, now we're going to spend 50 minutes on giving you a thorough explanation of who Batman is in this particular world. Nobody cares. We'll figure it out. You don't need to over-explain everything as far as who Bruce Wayne and Batman is. That explanation writes itself. And if you give us clues enough, we can kind of fill in the blanks. Just, just, just hit a couple of points in motion on the fly as we're going. As this train is coming out of the station. Give us, give us a couple of little nuggets and we'll fill in the gaps. Because we're not dumb. That's all you need to do. And as a result, you can have a balanced, even, interesting movie, not just a movie that feels like it's just pouring all the Batman it can onto the plate because I need, we need, it's Batman. Like, that's really the only reason for that is to just be like, but it's Batman. Like, but are we building towards, like, the Justice League, aren't we going to have a conflict with Superman? Isn't Lex Luthor in here? Doesn't Wonder Woman show up? Like, how does this all work? Don't worry, it's Batman. Like, that's not, an, it's not, it's not a reason. Because it's Batman. So there's that. Then, Zack Snyder wants to take shots at Marvel... Uh, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as if what he's doing is so much more important than what Marvel's doing. And look, I don't have any dog in this fight. I don't really care. I'm not Team DC. I'm not Team Marvel. I don't give a shit. I just want good films on both sides. I want good Marvel movies. I want good DC movies. So when something like Age of Ultron happens or Man of Steel... I get upset. I get disappointed because they're just... They're not up to par. They're less than movies. I want good, solid stories told with these characters because they're capable of some great things. It also doesn't mean that they're the be-all and end-all of, like, storytelling. And I think that's what Zack Snyder has to say here. Uh, so he's talking about... Uh, you know, lining up the DC Cinematic Universe uh, and, and kind of the importance of Batman and Superman. So he says, uh, quote, It's a tricky process setting up the DC Universe or Justice League. The credit goes to Chris Nolan because he set the die for the DC Universe in a great way that I tried to emulate. I look at it as more being mythological than, say, bubblegum. And I think that that's appropriate for Batman and Superman because they're the most mythological of our superheroes. It goes to the mythological nature of the movies that we're making. I feel like he's right. But I feel like Batman and Superman are transcendent of superhero movies in a way because they're Batman and Superman. They're not just like the flavor of the week Ant-Man. Not to be mean, but whatever it is. What is the next blank man? And... It just look. I first of all, it 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 pisses me off that that Zack Snyder has these characters at his disposal and feels the need to get into the gutter and throw shots at Marvel as a way of tearing down their product to build his up. 
the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has done what it's done. It's been incredibly successful at what it's done. They built thing, something from scratch that fans really embrace, and it is what it is. You know, you could take or leave some of it. Some of it's really good, some of it's not. But it is what it is. They make a lot of money, and fans really seem to enjoy it. Okay? That's the way that that works. And they have their own way of doing it. They've made it a little bit more comic booky, a little bit more fun, a little bit more light, and fans have taken to that and embraced it. DC, on the other hand, has done something different. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong. There's not just one way to make comic book and superhero movies, adaptations from the books. There's not just one way. There are many different ways that you can do it, and they can all be successful. Zack Snyder has, has decided, after following Christopher Nolan's lead, as well as what the suits of Warner Brothers wanted to do, to take a much more grounded, much more serious approach. Fine. Didn't really work with Man of Steel. Can it work moving forward? Absolutely. But in talking about it, with such seriousness, almost sucking the fun out of it, every every single ounce of fun out of it, because they're transcendent, mythological, amazing things, and not bub- oh, bubble gum. That's bubble gum. Yeah, you just chew it. Whatever. This is important. It just, like, do you hear yourself talking, man? Do you hear the words coming out of your mouth when you say these things? I agree, there are three high-tier superheroes that exist. Batman and Superman are two of them. But let's keep things in perspective. They're also fictional characters. Not real. They're, they're... They're just imaginary. And look, there is look, there are there are great stories that come from these, great backstories that come from these characters. I'm not, I'm not trying to demean superheroes or comic books in any way, shape, or form. I'm just trying to put them in perspective here. The same thing, the same way we look at something like Star Wars, or or, or, or any number of 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 big phenomenon they are what they are and to try and uh, place them on some immaculate pedestal as holier than thou greater than everything else I think it's just foolish and, and I think that permeates through the vision for the universe because now you're not making films for fans, you're not making films for entertainment, you're not making films for fun, you're not making films for enjoyment. You're making films for some other greater calling that no one is asking you to make them for. And I think that's where you run into problems, potential problems, with the future of the DC Cinematic Universe. I would love for Batman vs Superman to to just be a home run, to be to be everything that we wished Man of Steel could possibly be. I do, I absolutely do. Just like I hope that Captain America's Civil War on the other side will be something really fantastic. I mean, look, I'm I'm am first and first and foremost, I'm going in and I'm just hoping that they're going to be good. Not placing any type of unnecessary weight on them. I'm just hoping that they're going to be good. And anything beyond that, a bonus. A bonus. But to hold this up as some type of amazing, has to be amazing thing, I think you're setting yourself up for failure, dude. I think you really should take a look at why these characters have resonated with people for so long and are so incredibly popular. And I don't think 
it's for the serious reasons that you think. I I could be wrong. I I just don't see it. Just not seeing it. All right, uh, let's move over to uh, to a couple lighter things. Um, number one, uh, legendary. Uh, who used to be set up with Universal for distribution. Uh, that partnership ended. They moved over to Universal. Um, what they were doing, or what's in the works, was uh, they were going to do a King Kong uh, prequel, uh, so to speak, uh, called Kong Skull Island. Uh, and over at Warner Brothers, which is where Legendary used to be, um, they still maintain the rights. They're going to do... They're, they had plans for Godzilla. Well, what Legendary is now doing is they are moving Kong Skull Island over to Warner Brothers, where Godzilla is set up for a sequel uh, in 2018, with the idea of down the road setting up a, a cross monster type of universe that would have Godzilla versus King Kong square off one more time. They had it done once before in history. They're looking to do it again. When that film is going to happen, I have no idea. Uh, I think the plans are still to do a Godzilla sequel um, in 2018. I think that was still, you know, things could shift. But, uh, but I, but I think it's, I, th I think they still want to go forth with like um, Rodan and Ghidorah and, and Mothra first. Kind of show Godzilla to be a super badass, uh, and then you know, and, and, and kind of get those, some of those iconic figures uh, of Godzilla lore into the sequel before they have him fight King Kong. And I don't know how they're gonna have him fight King Kong anyway, because like King Kong fought a T Rex, two T Rexes in a Peter Jackson film uh, on Skull Island. Uh, Godzilla is 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 humongous. In the Gareth Edwards movie. I mean, humongous. King Kong has to, like, climb buildings. You know, King Kong climbs the Empire State Building. Uh, Godzilla stands next to it and knocks it over. So, like, I don't know how that, how they're going to make it work uh, size-wise. Um, but I think uh, modern day with what they could do with motion capture and whatnot... Uh, to have Godzilla and King Kong square off, uh, I, I think will be pretty cool at some point down the line. I hope it's not just spectacle. I hope there's a little bit something more to it. Uh, I, I liked Peter Jackson's King Kong a little bit longer than uh, than I'm comfortable with. Um, but, uh, but regardless, still, I, I found a pretty good film. Um, not really a fan of the first Godzilla, uh, of Gareth Edwards' Godzilla. Uh, I hope they can improve upon that in the sequel and figure out how to make both the human element and Godzilla work. Um, but I, I'll be down for, for some Godzilla uh, King Kong action uh, in the years to come. Um, what else do we got? Oh, Ronda Rousey. I brought her up earlier as being a, one of those rumored names for Captain Marvel. Uh, Ronda Rousey is going to star in a remake of Roadhouse for MGM. That's right. Roadhouse. A Patrick Swayze flick. And this is how classy Ronda Rousey is. Um, you know, like, she's still got a, a ways to go, I think, to make herself comfortable on screen and be able to carry a film uh, on her own. Uh, Roadhouse is obviously still being developed, so they're not just going to throw her in there, like, right away. Um, but here's how classy she was. She actually goes and reaches out to Patrick Swayze's widow to get her blessing to be part of a Roadhouse remake. That's some good stuff. Hey, look, Ronda Rousey, uh, UFC champion, MMA superstar. Um, if she's going to continue to try and make a transition into Hollywood, and she's tried in the past, you know, she was obviously in uh, uh, one of the Fast and Furious movies. I think uh, Furious 7 she was in, uh, once again, as a badass, uh, you know, who has a who has an amazing fight scene because that's what she, she's good at, at least right now at, at, on her on her base level, that's, that's what she's good at. Um, also got to play herself in the Entourage movie. Um, not quite as convincing as herself in the movie, but when she was in the, the Octagon, she she worked well because that's, that's what she knows. That's what she's good at. Uh, Roadhouse, I think, is going to be something, once again, that kind of feeds into her skill set and, 
you know, as kind of just being this this ass kicking woman uh, as a bouncer, uh, I think it would be pretty cool. And uh, Roadhouse is one of those those movies that people love that Patrick Swayze did way back in the day. You know, you got like Point Break and Ghost and Roadhouse. Like those are the three like go to Patrick Swayze films. So to remake it, you know, I think people were skeptical, but. Um, you know, lots of people like Ronda Rousey, especially once again being a UFC champion. That's kind of where her bread has been buttered all this time. And uh, to see her take on that lead role and, you know, it, it, we're kind of in a shift of, of having some of these uh, female empowerment films where, you know, what typically would have just been a role for, for a, a guy is now being shifted and, and we're getting to see women have a shot at this. So, uh, so I'm all for Ronda Rousey being able to have a shot at this and, and, and taking it and and running with it uh, as the star of a Roadhouse remake. Previously, had it been just like uh, just some other dude, I probably would have been far less interested than I am right now that Ronda Rousey is uh, is involved. So uh, so kudos to them for what I think is some some pretty cool casting. Hopefully that thing shakes out. Um, Transformers Five. There's rumors that there may be two plots. Um, for the untitled Transformers 5, which to me is interesting because it's two more plots than the previous four had combined. Uh, Mark Ryan, who uh, played Jetfire in Revenge of the Fallen, which was uh, really terrible, and Lockdown in Age of Extinction, which is only kind of bad, uh, said at the Wings and Wheels convention in the UK that um, what they're looking at is two different plots. One that would have Marky Mark and the Dinobots save Earth from, you know, whatever threat is coming to destroy the world uh, this time around. And then the other plot would have Optimus Prime heading into space to find the Quintessens, who are the creators of the Autobots and the Decepticons, and as well as confronting uh, Unicron, who is a big deal uh, in Transformers lore. And, like, I don't even know why they try to pretend anymore. Like, this once again goes back to, um, you know, like, treating us like we're stupid we're not stupid. Uh, the people who go to see Transformers movies, I think at this point, understand what these movies are, which are basically um, really long, boring films that only pick up when robots start beating the shit out of each other. And then they just they forget about all like the stuff that just they zoned out on. Like they were like, oh, what am I gonna have for dinner? But like they think about that for like an hour and forty minutes out of a two and a half hour movie, and then like the other forty five minutes or fifty minutes, that's when all the action kicks in. They're like, oh, well, see, this movie's amazing. Um, so to try and just like squeeze like a legitimate plot, like I appreciate the effort from Michael Bay and whoever is writing this thing. But uh, let's not pretend that these movies are ever about anything. Uh, even going back to the first one, which I like, uh, there's really not much of a story there. You know, and, and even then, the first movie, I think, was just all the novelty. The novelty of watching robots in disguise, like, fight each other. Because we hadn't really seen that before. Then, like, once we got past that and the novelty was off, like, I was, I was hip to, what, to their game, to what they were doing. With like each, each film progressively seeming to have less story than the one before. You know, Re uh, Revenge of the Fallen is probably like the most egregious. As as that's true, Revenge of the Fallen is probably has the least amount of story uh, over all of them in the sequel. Like that, I just don't know that they actually gave a shit in that movie. Like you know, you get the racist twin robots and the one with the giant balls. Like it just, it just like. It's almost like they were like, well, don't worry about the story. We'll just fill in whatever stupid shit we can. And in the meantime, like, we'll just, we'll have, like, these cool robots and that'll be the end of it. Uh, so, like, to now try and make a conscious effort to put, like, plot in, I think your four films too late. Like, anybody who who is just like, I'm, I can't watch this this anymore is, is really bad. Uh, we're not going to come back because now we've been promised a plot. Like, we thought there was a plot, like, three movies ago, and there wasn't. So, like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three and four times, now I'm just a masochist. 
Uh, and, uh, like, to get all the way to five and, like, still be getting fooled? Come on. You got problems. You need to, like, really look at yourself in the mirror and say, like, what are my priorities and what do I value in life? Because I, I guarantee it's not, like, a another plotless shitty Transformers movie. It just, it can't be. <clears throat> so that's there. And then uh, one final note uh, before we wrap this thing up. Uh, the fucking Catalina wine mixer was just this past weekend. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, you really should correct your life. Uh, that comes from the Will Ferrell, John C. Riley comedy, uh, Step Brothers, which to me is the best movie they've made together. Uh, I know that there are other people who like the other ones, but this is the best one. And and for people who want to like throw Anchorman out as like a better Will Ferrell comedy, uh, they're just wrong. Step Brothers is easily uh, much more quotable. That's right, much more quotable than any of those Anchorman movies, and just 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 funnier, just like hardcore funnier. Um, but there's a there's a bit towards the end uh, with this huge event called the Carolina Wine Mixer, and everybody refers to it as the fucking Catalina Wine Mixer. Uh, and it was never a real thing. Like, the movie created this thing. I think it's, like, this, like the one of the largest helicopter leasing events or something like that. Uh, and, and, like, that's partially why it's a big deal uh, in the film. But um, it was never a real thing. And uh, I didn't know that uh, for a while. I was like... Fucking Catalina wine mixer sounds amazing. Like you just everybody sits around and just drinks wine, eats cheese, listens to like eighties Billy Joel cover bands. Like this is a this is a great time. Like out in the beauty of like Catalina out in California. Like it's, a, it's it looks incredible. Uh, but it was never a real thing until this year. This year they actually made it. The Santa Catalina Island Company put on the the Catalina wine mixer at uh, Descanso Beach Club. Uh, this past Sunday, the Dan Band, uh, who's a great cover band, if you've never seen him, uh, hilariously funny. Uh, I know they have some albums on iTunes. You absolutely check them out. Uh, they're best known as the Wedding Band in uh, in old school. Um, really funny. They're gonna be. They were headlining. Uh, they had some other people who also showed up. Other artists. I don't know if John C. Riley or Will Ferrell showed up, but I would hope they did. Uh, I remember talking to Will Ferrell a couple years back about a movie and um, when nobody came in to, to like break up our conversation we just did like we just chatted for like 10 minutes about the popularity of Step Brothers so I would hope uh, that um, that they that they would go out there and embrace it I know that it happened I didn't get to go I'm really sad about it uh, not upset just sad uh, that I wasn't there for the inaugural Catalina wine mixer and hopefully, if uh, if it was successful, they continue to make this an annual event. One year, I'm going to the fucking Catalina Wine Mixer. And it's going to be amazing. And, um, yeah, and that's that. So, uh, with that said, that's the show. That's going to bring a, a close to, uh, to this debut episode of uh, Just the Worst Podcast. So, uh, not too bad. So, we went against the namesake. Uh, which is the point. Uh, it is just a clever name. Uh, not really uh, a, an evaluation of the quality of the show. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you made it all the way through. I hope you it, it gave you some things to think about and consider. That's ultimately, once again, the point. And uh, if I can inform you with a little bit of entertainment, um, then uh, kudos to me. Give myself a nice pat on the bat. I uh, did my job. Uh, at least for this time. So um, be sure to follow me on Twitter uh, at Infamous Kid. You can follow me on Twitter at Infamous Kid. I tweet a lot. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook. Um, I got to find a name for that one right there. Uh, let me see. That. Actually, no, I, I can get it for you really quickly uh, so, so that you don't have to lose lose out or miss out on any of that good stuff. Uh, that's just Facebook.com slash Billy the Kid. That's uh, Facebook.com slash Billy the Kid kid with two d's at the end so make sure you type it in correctly uh over there you can also make sure you follow on uh instagram and snapchat uh, all those things all that information is out there for you to be able to grab uh so by all means you know, lock on to any one of those and uh, you get more information about the future of this and um 
And once again, we'll have more shows coming up, so stay tuned. I absolutely promise you uh, there there will be at least, I think, one other podcast dropping uh, this week, making also a debut episode. So be sure to keep your eye out for that. And uh, I thank you uh, very much for coming along with me on this journey once again, uh, for coming along in, in, in my renewed enthusiasm uh, for podcasting. And uh, hopefully great things are on the horizon and you get to be a part of listening to them because uh, that's that's how this equation works. So um, I'm going to get out of here. Make sure, once again, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever, get it and, uh, and uh, listen to the show. Send in all the feedback that you possibly can. And uh, I'll be back next week for another episode of Just the Worst Podcast. Thank you for listening. I'm Billy Donnelly. You can follow me also at thisisinfamous.com as well as joeblow.com. And uh, for right now, make sure you have a pleasant, immediate future. I'm out. Just the Worst Podcast, episode number one, has been a presentation of Just the Worst Podcast Media.